Book of Jude, verses 20 and 21. So notice this, what he says in verse 20, But ye, beloved, speaking to believers, to Christians, he says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And then verse 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference. Let's kind of give you a little bit of information what's going on here in this chapter. Jude had just finished, when he comes to verse 20, he's just finished detailing um, the characteristics, detailing the characteristics of certain men, he said, who had crept in unawares into uh, the Christian faith. Uh, and, and, and some who were kind of just out there creating problems uh, in, in, in the Christian faith by uh, the questions and, the, and, uh, and challenging what the Word of God has to say about things. And they'd crept in unawares into the Christian faith. These were men, he says, that are ungodly and who, according to Jude, are ordained to condemnation. It is the way what's going to happen. They are a condemned people. And because of the things that they're teaching, the things that they're doing, it is a they are facing the condemnation of God. And his words are to, uh, uh, concerning these certain men who have crept in unawares. Uh, his words are, are scathing, to say the least. If you were to read all of the book of Jude up until verse 20, uh, everything he says is, um, is I, mean, uh, I mean, very pointed, uh, very confrontational concerning these who, had, who were bringing in damnable heresies into the, into the things of God. But I want you to, to remind you that he's not, his purpose is not to badmouth his enemies. No place in the scriptures should you take it that what's happening is someone is just pouring out venom against people who they don't like. The purpose of the Bible, God is not that way. The purpose of the Bible isn't that way. God's word does not give any one of us permission to be hateful and mean-spirited and, and despair. And, and despise others. It doesn't give us the, the right to do that, the permission to do that. And when the Bible does say things like it says in the book of Jude and in other places where it speaks of condemnation and things that... The point is, number one, to try to bring the lost to a place where they will trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And number two, to cause the Christians to be warned and beware the tools they need to, to counter and, and, and to stay on focus and to grow for the Lord Jesus Christ. His purpose, again, is not to badmouth his enemies, but to help his brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ to grow. And so, after he gets through describing the circumstances about these certain men uh, who are ordained to condemnation, he turns in verse 20 to give five habits that are meant to protect believers from these wolves in sheep's clothing. Things that are meant to, to strengthen and to protect and build up believers. Number one, he says, uh, starting in verse 25, things he gives here. He says, number one, building up yourselves in, on your most holy faith. So this is going to be something that a person who's really, who's right with the Lord and who's growing in Christ is going to do. He's going to work at building up himself on his faith. And then he's going to, he t says, the next one, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then there's kind of a change there. In verse 20, uh, there's the, or, uh, uh, verse 20, there's the, the building and the praying. And in verse 20, a little bit the the terminology changes it goes from building and praying and then he says keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life and so the five things are building up yourselves on your faith praying in the Holy Ghost keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life and some have compassion and goes on from 22, 23, speaking about soul winning, doing, reaching out to others, having an outreach, trying to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, I want to concentrate uh, our attention for the next little bit just on the, on the very first of those, uh, the building up yourselves on your most holy faith. I want to concentrate on that for just a little bit tonight. I'm going to touch on some other things that are found in these, in these five, but I want to kind of uh, concentrate on that. And, uh, and, and speak to you, address the idea of, of, of building up yourself in your faith or on your faith. I, you know, I think most Christians who, most Christians that take the, most Christians that take to build themselves in the faith, they take it more as an abstract kind of concept rather than something that you really can do. 
Um, you know, we know the Bible tells us to build ourselves in on our faith, and we, we, we know that the Bible says that we ought to grow in grace and things like that, but, uh, you know, the how-to seems a little bit uh, vague to us, and I think a lot of times what we do is we, is, is, is we hope that building up ourselves and um, increasing in uh, godliness and growing in grace, we hope those things are going to happen, um, you know, by our godly lifestyle. You know, we come to church and we give and we sing the songs and we pray and we might teach a Sunday school class or whatever we do. And, we, and we're hoping we're, that somehow by doing those things uh, that the, the building up ourselves and the growing is happening, um, happening kind of uh, in the sidelines on its, on, on, by accident. I, I know a few Christians, I, I know few Christians, I think, who can give um, a meaningful plan that's meant to uh, make them grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know very few Christians, I think, uh, and, uh, and I might be making an assumption, it might be that more um, have a plan than, than I'm aware of, but when I speak to Christians, um, I, I, I don't hear an awful, lot of, uh, an awful lot today of Christians who are really doing any, their, their plan for Christianity is, well, pray over my meals, um, I read my Bible some, uh, and, and to be honest with you, uh, I, I kind of stop even really asking how many people read their Bible every day because it's pretty discouraging. Most pastors don't read their Bible every day. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me how, how many pastors I know who in a conversation, in conversations with me have said, well, you know, I try to get that done every day. <laughs> But most pastors don't do it. You know, the ministry gets in the way. You know, I got people to pray for and people to visit. And, you know, I got things to do and administration, you know, and reading the Bible doesn't happen very often. And a very good number of pastors that, you know, at least the ones that I, I don't talk to everyone, but, uh, but those who have asked. It's, it's shocking how many preachers don't spend time actually in their Bible. But most of us, what we, I think what happens in most cases... We, we, our plan for Christianity is we, we pray over our meals and maybe a little bit extra, uh, more prayer than that. We read our Bible, most, you know, a pretty good chunk and, uh, you know, maybe not every day, some people, but, and, and we attend church uh, most of the time. You know, almost every Christian thinks, uh, you know, I, we attend church on a regular basis, but if, if circumstances prevent me from coming to a service or two, um, you know, it's not that big of a, of a deal and we can miss a few without uh, much trouble. Um, and, uh, and it seems to me like I know very few Christians um, who really, ha who have a plan meant to help them to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what I want to do tonight is I want to share with you what has been my plan, personal spiritual growth. Um, it's going to, it's developed over the, over the years and my plan isn't the same as it was when it started, when I started the Christian walk. Um, and when I first uh, uh, began, even not when, I, not only when I started the Christian walk, but then when I became a pastor, uh, I have uh, changed kind of the plan over the years and developed it and tweaked it some. It changed uh, significantly uh, uh, seven or eight years ago after uh, attending uh, uh, classes before we started our addictions program classes uh, to prepare us for that, and I learned some ideas and learned some things uh, for devotions at that time that uh, have uh, dramatically changed um, how, uh, how I do my devotions and really kind of helped me to, to actually write down a plan. While I had a plan before, um, I, I would, while I had something that I did before and I did it regularly and consistently and, and purposefully, um, it was uh, after that that I was able to start kind of putting some ideas and, and be able to put my, my ideas onto paper and actually uh, give it some order. And, um, and what I want to do, and, and to be honest with you, I hope what I'm doing now in my devotions uh, and my walk with God, I hope it's not finished. I hope it's not a finished product. And uh, I want to continue growing as a believer until the day I die. And I'm sure that part Part of growing as a believer until the day I die is going to be uh, tweaking how I do my walk with God as well and, 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 and building that and adding to it and, and so forth as the years go, go on. I also think as I get started tonight, uh, I want to, uh, again, emphasize as I tried to do this morning uh, be, as introduction for this evening, I want to emphasize that um, 
But I'm, I'm not going to give this this evening saying with the, I'm not trying to tell you tonight that you can't be right with God unless you do your devotional life like I do. Because I don't believe that. Uh, I believe a devotional life, a walk with God is a personal thing and I think it needs to be personal. I think it, we need to develop it. Uh, each of us have different circumstances that we, uh, we live through. My uh, walk with the Lord, the, the, the plan that I use, the daily walk that I use, begins with about a two hour um, isolated time where I get alone and I spend about two hours by myself with just me and the Lord. Once in a while, Anita will come in and interrupt, but uh, I usually soundly tell her to, you know, I'm, you know, I'm talking to God right now, and so, and um, most of the time that works. Not always, but uh, most of the time. And uh, and but about two hours, and then there are other things that kind of happen throughout the day. And so I'm not trying to tell you you need to. Not, I know understand. I understand that not everyone would be able to take two hours, and I don't think that that's what's important. I think what's important. I think a person could do this in 15 minutes if that's what God gives them. The key is that it's purposeful. The key is that it's purposeful. So I, I don't want to present myself today as having in any way arrived and that my plan is the plan that you have to use. And if you don't do devotions like I do them, then you're not right with the Lord. I, I just want to give you tonight um, some, some things that may work for you and some ideas uh, that uh, will help you in your own walk with the Lord. And I want to encourage you to, to form a meaningful walk with God. Um, not one of those things, because I, I think most of us, I, I think it's right for a Christian to recognize his inadequacy. I don't think it's right for a Christian to live um, under the impression that he's always a failure to God. I don't think it's right for a Christian to spend his, in, his or her entire life feeling like, well, I really should have prayed more. I really should have read my Bible more. I really should have walked with God more. I, I don't think it's right for us to live that way. I don't think we have to live that way. I think if we, if, we, uh, if we have a plan and we are working that plan and we've asked the Holy Spirit to help us in that plan and we're tweaking that plan as the Spirit of God uh, uh, grows us, then I, I believe that we can end each day having realized that that day was spent with God. And that's where I think a Christian ought to be. I think we ought to be able to close our eyes at night and know we spent that day with God. And, and that's what I'd like to, to be able to, uh, to present tonight and the idea that I want to get across. I, so what I'm going to do this evening, really, I'm going to kind of bring this uh, to you tonight under two headings. First of all, I want to talk about a philosophy of um, you know, how we walk with God and, and, and the ideas behind it. And then secondly, some nuts and bolts, the practice of, of, a, of a devotional life, a daily walk with the Lord. Number one, a meaningful plan, uh, a meaningful plan to grow in grace. I want to talk first of all about the philosophy. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, the Bible says to the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So the Bible says that Jesus increased or grew in three areas. Uh, he increased or grew in three areas in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. Those things roughly, uh, those things, the three here, roughly correspond to the three parts of man. This is kind of how, in my mind, this is how I lay out why I do what I do in my devotional life. It roughly con corresponds with the three parts of man. The spirit, which is our connection with God. The, um, I, uh, the spirit, which is our connection with God. The soul, which is our connection with other people. And then the body, which is our connection to the earth that we're on right now. Let's talk about each one of these individually. The Spirit, um, our connection with God. It's through the Spirit, the Bible says, that we walk with God. Uh, it's, uh, it corresponds with Jesus increasing in favor with God. And this is where uh, I'm going to spend most of, uh, most of our time talking about how we walk in the Spirit and how we live in the Spirit and, and kind of deal with that a little bit. There are three keys to growing spiritually, I think. Um, Bible, prayer, and church. Three keys to growing spiritually, I think. Bible, uh, prayer, and church. Bible is not just reading the Bible, but learning it and heeding it, practicing the Word of God. Uh, prayer, 
uh, is born out of the things that God has taught me in the Bible. So prayer is not just, you know, I write down a list and boy, what are the things that I'd really like to have? Hmm. You know, it'd be nice to have a brand new vehicle. And uh, boy, it sure would be nice if, um, you know, I got a promotion at work and, you know, and put down a list of things that I'd really like to have someday, dream things. And, and you know, that's going to be what I pray about. Uh, prayer really ought to be uh, something much greater and much deeper than that. And, and, uh, and it ought to be something that is, I, I think prayer in order for it to really be what it ought to be, it, 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 prayer should come from, spring from what God tells us in our Bible reading. So we're reading the Word of God, hearing from God as we read His Word, and then we pray in response to the things that He's taught us. And church is assembling ourselves together for worship and also to provoke one another to love and to good works. Um, the soul, it's our connection with, with others. Uh, inside the soul, this, they taught me this in Bible college, and, and I find this in the scriptures as well. I'm not going to go through and explain all the places tonight, but inside our soul, which is our connection with other people, is the mind, the will, and the emotions and emotions and it's how we connect with others, and it corresponds with Jesus increasing in favor with man. Um, we'll never be able to really reach men unless we have some favor with them. And, you know, as Christians, we want to reach people with the gospel. We're not going to be able to reach them unless we have some favor with them. And there are things that we need to do in order to, to get along with others and how to relate with and communicate with and have, uh, you know, uh, and, and have fellowship with other people. There are things that ought to be done in order to help us to know how to fellowship with others. And, and, and I get most of my ideas about, um, you know, about how to grow in in my soul and mind, will, and emotions. I get most of it from things that I've read about um, uh, guys like Benjamin Franklin, uh, George Washington, and then also um, a preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Benjamin Franklin um, formed, I've, I've mentioned this before, he, he formed one time in his life as a young man, he, did, he, he, um, he uh, gathered together a group of about 12 friends, all of them wanting to do something with their life and, uh, you know, Franklin's childhood and background was a little bit rough. He was sold, his father sold him to his brother as a printer's apprentice and uh, at a print shop, sold to his brother. His brother treated him roughly. Uh, Benjamin Franklin actually ran away from his brother, you know, because he was sold as an apprentice. I mean, he really can't leave his brother's uh, employment and it's not like he's free to go. He actually ran away from his brother and later felt bad about it and tried to make restitution uh, with his brother and so forth. And, and, and so I had some a pretty rough childhood, but he wanted to, he knew he wanted to do something with his life. And so as a young man, he and a, a group of friends, about 12 of them, formed what they called a junto. And it was, um, it was a group of men who gathered together. They gathered together. Uh, and I think it was weekly at the time. They gathered weekly for the purpose of growth, personal growth. They got together. They would uh, assign each other things to do, uh, a written assignment. Um, they would plan, they would get together and one of them would be assigned uh, to speak and to bring a present a, an, or, uh, an oration with the others and, uh, and what they would do is if they were assigned a, per, a particular writing assignment then the others would critique the work and help them you know here's where your, you know, your writing should have been better and your grammar should have been better and your rhetoric could have been better here you could have done this a little bit better and, they, and then they would um, speak and then they would critique one another in their speaking and, and out of this junto came all kinds of interesting things uh, it was, he did it almost all of his life and uh, never did allow the junto to become any larger than about 12. It, the numbers of people changed. And at one point, they realized the need to spread out and do this more. So the original 12 uh, split up into several other juntos and exactly and gra gathered themselves together small groups of people so that they could so that they could continue to grow personally and out of the junto came things like the public library and uh, system and um, and uh, there was uh, and the fire department were ideas that this small group of people who were just trying to be better men uh, came up with ideas that they came up with in their time and the idea of just purp uh, purposely provoking one another to grow and you know I, I see so very little of that today we are, our egos are so fragile, the last thing we'd want anyone to do is to tell us we could do better. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, technically you're not doing that right. Yeah, but that's the way I do it, and so leave me alone. <laughs> that's how we are. You know? Don't be telling me I'm doing it wrong. I do it the way I want to do it. I don't care if there's a better way to do it. I don't care if there's a right way to do it. I do it this way. 
And, uh, you know, that's how we are today. We don't want to really uh, advance and grow. We just want to be left alone and, you know, don't hurt my feelings and those kinds of things. And it's not like I want to have my feelings hurt, but I do want to grow. Um, I w I'm listening to this. I'm always listening to these while I'm doing my exercising. I listen to these college courses. And one of the college courses I'm taking right now or that I'm watching right now is um, it's a, a Harvard professor teaching on, he, his class is called Justice, and so he's a very famous, um, written several books, a uh, famous Harvard professor by the name of Michael Sandel. And he's talking about uh, a philosopher by the name of John Rawls. And he keeps, throughout this lesson, lecture, he keeps saying, uh, he talks about Rawls's philosophy. <clears throat> There's only one Rawls. Rawls's is in proper English. It's not Rawls's, it's Rawls' philosophy. It's not Rawls's philosophy, it's Rawls' philosophy. Because when you write, you don't write, when you, uh, 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 a name ends with S, you don't say S apostrophe S, you say S apostrophe. You know why I know that? Because for years and years when I would preach, I would say, I would talk about Jesus's life. And when I went to work at the Bible college, I traveled around preaching all the time. And I'm at this particular church, and this guy comes up. He says, I am an English preacher and a teacher, and I want to tell you something. There is only one Jesus. And you are teaching heresy by talking about all these Jesuses. There's not Jesus's life. There's Jesus' life. And, uh, and by being rebuked by this guy, I got this one figured out. I do an awful lot of grammar mistakes, but I got that one down. And so uh, I got that one down because someone had enough courage to walk up to me and say, you know, that's not right. <laughs> and, and straighten that out of my life. And, you know, um, I'm glad that, not, that, that I don't have it happen every time that I preach to someone who walks up. And let me just express to you all of the mistakes that you made tonight. I'm glad that that doesn't happen every time, but I'm also glad that sometimes a person will walk up and say, you know, let me just point out an, an, an error and uh, point out a, a something that can help you out. And, and Benjamin Franklin belonged to a group where that's what they did. They critiqued one another so that they could grow. George Washington is another one that uh, I think of in this area. George Washington um, memorized, I've mentioned this several times, memorized uh, and not only memorized, but practiced a list of something like little, just over a hundred different manners. Just things that were manners, and, he, and, and his practice of this list of manners created in him such a reputation that it made him very likely the only man in his day who could have led the Continental Army and become the first president of the United States. Our, the, our country at that time was in such a fragile condition they were the the, the 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 people who were of the new england colonies were so afraid of authority so afraid of monarchies and so afraid that if they um you know they're they're a, a, a pond away an ocean away from the king and so afraid they don't like what the king is doing and he is i mean he's being tyrannical and something has to be done about that but the last thing they want to do is overthrow a, 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 a tyrant and and uh, and empower a second one yeah. closer yeah. and they're very afraid that whatever will happen that if they give anyone authority over an army that person will become a dictator a tyrant here on this soil and that will be much worse than a tyrant who's an ocean away and they're very afraid that it will you know that this this dictator or if you know he gets an army and then he may become if we put him as a king here on this on this continent who knows what kind of a king and they are very afraid and the only reason that our country that the leaders who uh, founders of our of our country were willing to do what they did is because there was a man who uh, who lived at that time that they knew to have such impeccable character that he could be trusted with an army and not become a, that he wouldn't become a tyrant and that he could be entrusted with the presidency without him becoming a king yeah. they knew that if washington said i want limited authority and that i will only stay in in um, in office for a particular time and i won't become a king they knew that if washington said that he meant it they knew if washington said i will uh, be the commander in chief of the army for a period of time and when the when the when the objective is reached that i will re, uh, that i will um, uh, uh, relieve myself from the from the office of commander in chief they knew that if he said that he would do it and that's the only reason why these men were willing to say let's band together let's put together an army and let's get some established here to find it because there was because there was one man who when he was a teenager said I'll learn manners 
And some of them are just, you know, things that, you know, seem kind of ridiculous to us. You know, you don't do this in front of people. Um, you don't clean your teeth or your fingernails in front of people. Um, you don't make rude gestures in front of people. You stand when a woman enters a room. Just simple little things. You know, they're not, you know, life-changing things. They're just simple little rules and, that are meant to, to, to express care for other people. That's what manners are, by the way. When, when you behave well and you exercise manners, what you're doing is you're, telling you, you're saying to the people around you that you care for them. And that's all you're doing. And Washington was learned these things so that he, uh, because he wanted, to, he wanted to have a good reputation. He wanted to care for people, for others. And then Jonathan Edwards, pastor uh, in uh, the 1700s, um, whose purposeful approach to the ministry gave him the reputation. He is to this day considered the greatest theologian that our country has ever produced. And, um, and he wrote down a list. He said, here's how I'm going to spend my day. And he had a certain number of hours that he spent in study, a certain number of hours he spent in um, like visitation and those kind of things, ministry type of things, and a certain number of hours that he spent sleeping. He didn't give himself time to eat, but I assume that he figured that would happen somewhere along the way too. And, uh, but that was, he had, he had a, a written out, a purposeful life that he lived. And, um, and through the, the stories and the example of those three men, I began trying to develop, you know, something that would be a purposeful, a written out purposeful philosophy, how I was going to, you know, conduct my walk with the Lord too. And so our connection with other people can be divided, I think, into three parts. Got them up there. Communication with others, our reputation, and then our outreach. Communication, reputa reputation, and outreach. Communication involves, uh, to communicate with others involves really three skills. That's um, the rhetoric, which is the art of speaking and writing in, in a convincing manner. Um, logic, which is the ability to form accurate conclusions from the written and verbal communications of others. So I have to be able to communicate so that you understand. But I have to be able to understand your communication back. <clears throat> Years ago, I was uh, here at the church, and there, we were having a preacher's meeting, and, and I'm sitting out to lunch, and I'm in a conversation with another preacher, and I disagreed with the preacher, or he disagreed with me. I can't remember which one, which one was which, but we had a disagreement. And so, now we aren't arguing, we're not fighting or anything, but we are, we are discussing an, a, our disagreement. And in the middle of our discussion, I quoted a scripture, and when I quoted that scripture, and I remember him saying, stopping, pausing for a second, and, but I didn't hear what happened after he paused. I changed his mind with that scripture. But I didn't know it. So I kept arguing. And pretty soon one of the other pastors said, Brother McKenzie, you want him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you've convinced him. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to keep this up. He's already convinced. In the, oh, oh. So, you know, in communication, that happens. You know, there, in order for communication to work, I not only have to be able to convince you, I also have to be able to listen and figure out what the other person is saying and, and know what they're saying so, and understand what they're saying. And then language is the rules of speech and grammar uh, necessary to do both of those others well. And then reputation re is tied to the personal disciplines of manners, attitude, and personal growth. Uh, manners, which speaks of how others perceive me. Attitude, which speaks about how I perceive the events of life. You know, my attitude, whether I'm positive or negative. Uh, something happens and I let it really get me down. Or something happens and I really get wired up over to those kind of things. Attitude is how I perceive the things that are happening around me. And personal growth, that speaks about my com commitment to, uh, to my relationships with others. Um, I think a clearer word for outreach would be generosity. And that's like the word I like to use is generosity in my outreach with others, generosity is um, ministry. I'm going to give myself uh, to meet the spiritual and physical needs of others. That's ministry. Uh, concern for others, being aware of their feelings and preferences, their background and their special days in their life. And then thoughtfulness, which is reaching out to people in a manner that is appropriate in, 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 in certain times of their life. Then uh, there's the body. That's our connection with the earth. And I think uh, my responsibility toward my body, as I mentioned, I think during the Sunday school lesson today, it's to mortify the deeds of the flesh. So when I think about, you know, my spirit, that's my, my connection with God, I want to grow in my connection with God. When I think about my soul, my connection with others, I want to improve in my uh, communication, my connection with others. When I think about my body and its connection to this earth, what I want to do with that is I want to kill it. I want to mortify it. I want to I become 
become less and less attached to this world, more and more attached to the Lord. I'm going to do that through three things. Humility, confession of my sins, and then personal discipline. Humility. Now, here's, I read a book years ago by Andrew Murray. It's a short book, really easy to read, and I try to give it to people when, when I can. Um, in, in the book, Andrew Murray says this. He says, God exalts, he only exalts humble people. But you can't choose to be humble. You have to be humiliated. Therefore, you should be thankful for anyone or any circumstance in your life that humiliates you. How many of you like being humiliated? Yeah. So he says, God, it is a gift of God when someone or something brings humiliation in your life because it's the only way for you to develop humility. And humility is the only thing that God will exalt. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, humility. Then there's confession of sin. Uh, confession requires that I'm aware of my sin and then that I acknowledge that my, that my sin before God. So I spend time confessing my sin. Discipline, and that's just practicing moderation and purpose in eating exercise and work and those kind of things. And all of this, all of this that I've just given to you, the philosophy is meant to give direction and purpose to my spiritual walk. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to wander aimlessly in a spiritual wilderness. I want to have direction somewhere that I am. Uh, somewhere I am driving toward, and somewhere I want to arrive at in my personal uh, in my personal walk with God. And that's why I have the philosophy around uh, in, uh, the spirit, the soul, and the body, and increasing in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. Now, on the more practical side. I put together, I'm going to call it tonight a path, and number one is my, my Bible time. Uh, my Bible time. I read the Bible purposefully, and you can do this a lot of different ways, depending upon your own circumstances. I, right now, read two book chapters of the Old Testament, one chapter of the New Testament, uh, every day. Uh, unless there are reasons, you know, that that doesn't work. Sometimes, because the, my purpose is not to read two chapters of the Old Testament, one chapter of the New Testament. I want to hear from God. And if for some reason circumstances are such that on a particular day, um, you know, um, that's too much to read, uh, you know, because that there, just happens. Sometimes you're, in, you're in, a, in a bind. You don't have much time, maybe as much time as normal. And, uh, and if you're thinking, I've only got, uh, I usually take two hours, but I've only got 30 minutes. And so I'm not going to have time to do anything else, but I'm going to have to race through the, to read two chapters of the New Te Old Testament, one chapter of the New. Well, when that happens, I don't do that. I read a chapter of the New Testament. Or I read a chapter of the Old Testament. Or I, because my purpose is I want to hear from God. I want to read whatever I read slowly enough and carefully enough that I remember what it is I read. And I want to hear from God. I want to read it so carefully enough that I can hear from the Lord each day. And it might be that for some, that reading um, five verses is going to accomplish that purpose for you. I'm not suggesting that you should only read five verses of the Bible a day. But if, it, if you, the only way that you can read the Bible in such a way that you actually hear from God is to read just five verses a day slowly and carefully and with meditation, read five verses a day. The point is to hear from God. Um, and, and you need to make sure that you hear from God. Uh, the goal, again, I hear to hear from the Lord and not just so you can accomplish a certain amount of reading. Um, when a, uh, and then what I do is I'm reading the Word of God. I read it slowly. I try to read it very carefully. I try to not let my mind, while I'm reading the Word of God, I try not to let my mind wander around. Here's what will happen. I'm reading my Bible. And my wife will come in and say, Hey, what about... And most of the time, I would stop whatever I was doing to talk to my wife. But when I'm reading my Bible, I need to be talking to God. And I need to tell my wife, and I do tell my wife, you know what? I'm reading my, the scriptures right now, talking to, in fact, I don't even say I'm reading the Bible. I say, I'm speaking with God right now. <laughs> so, you're interrupting a conversation. Whoever it is that I'm saying, you know, you know, you're interrupting a conversation. Anyone like that? You're in a, in a really good conversation while someone walks up and just interrupts the conversation? No one likes that. I'm in a conversation with God. Don't interrupt the conversation. That, and, and I use my wife as, a, as just kind of an illustration because she's not in the room, won't throw anything at me, I know. And, and so I get away with this. But it can happen with, with a lot of other things, you know, the phone rings or whatever it is. But when I'm in my Bible time, when I am talking to God or letting God, having God talk to me, I don't want to be distracted from that. I want to, uh, I want to read slowly, read carefully, and read with thoughtfully, and I want to read until God 
speaks to me. And, 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 and how I, I usually take that is a verse will strike me in some way. Um, it'll stick out. It'll stand out. And, uh, and whenever a verse stands out, I try to make note of it. Mark it down in some way so that I can remember that I've, that I've seen that. And sometimes um, it'll stand out because it's a doctrine that I'm learning a doctrine. Sometimes it'll be um, a command. I see a command that, boy, I ought to be doing that. Uh, sometimes it'll be a comforting thought. Uh, sometimes it'll be a convicting truth in my life. And I try, one of the things you've got to be careful of is not to judge, uh, you know, what verse strikes out and say, oh, well, you know, that verse is just a doctrine. I already know that doctrine, and so I don't want to pay any attention to it. I'm going to keep looking. If, that's the, if a passage stands out, to you, um, um, Mark, believe that God's using that in your life right then. The Holy Spirit is pointing it out to you. One of the problems that I had early on is, um, because what I'm going to do, I'll show you this in a minute, is what I do is once I've got that passage, I write it down and I carry it with me all day long. And I look to add it and refer to it from time to time. When things come up in my, I will take that verse out. I'll meditate and think about it. And, some, and then I, and I write it out. And then I keep a record of writing it out. And here's the problem. When I keep a record of writing it out, sometimes I find out that two years ago, I, it was the same verse. And at first, that bothered me. Why would the Holy Spirit point out the same verse twice? And at first it bothered me. I've come to a place where I just don't let that bother me anymore. I don't try to judge um, what, I'm, what God is speaking to me about. I don't try to fit it into a box. I use my devotions a lot of times what I'll, I'll come to a Saturday morning when we have, uh, get ready to go out of visitation. And I just share what I learned in my devotions in visitation time. And sometimes it'll have to do with visitation. It'll be a lesson that will be beneficial and appropriate for visitation. Sometimes it has nothing to do with visitation at all. And I, so I had to really practice and, and learn not to say, well, this is Saturday. In a few minutes, I'm going to be talking to people in front of people. I'm going to have to give them a devotion. And so God, what you tell me today has to have to do with these people. And uh, you know what? Um, I came into my devotional time to hear from God, not to write a lesson. And I've just determined that I'm going to share my lesson with others, but I came to hear from God not to write a lesson. And, and so don't let yourself get into I've had to me and say, well, pastor, you know, I've tried this and it doesn't work for me because God doesn't speak to me. And he does. It's just what they're looking for when they say God doesn't speak for me, to me. What they're looking for uh, isn't what God says. God is speaking to them. They're just looking for, expecting that he's going to speak a different way. So when, I, when I, I, I'm reading my scriptures, and, I'm, and I do it systematically, like I, said, I don't think anyone ought to just open their Bible and read it any place, you know, just wherever, open it up and just read five verses any place you want to. If you're going to read five verses a day, I think you ought to have a system where you're reading, uh, you know, the New Testament or the Old Testament, or you're reading the book of Proverbs or whatever it's going to be, that you're, you're using kind of some kind of system to get through the scriptures. But then write out, so as you do this, write out, right after you come to that passage that just kind of stands out to you, write it out so that you can get at it uh, all day long. It used to be that what I do is I'd take a 3 by 5 card and write it on a 3 by 5 card, put it in my pocket and keep it there. I now keep it in my, um, my smartphone. And so I've got it in there where I can just pull it up and I can look at it through the day. Uh, on, uh, but write it out. Um, I also, every time, this is why sometimes if you need to b b uh, shorten out how much of the Bible you read to make this work, go ahead and do that. Because after I come up with that passage, I don't just read it right out the verse. I take some time to study the verse. I want to maybe pull out a dictionary and look up some words and find out what the words mean. And maybe read uh, so what someone else has written about that verse. And, and so I've got some ideas about it so that I can meditate on it. Then, again, pull it out several times during the day to just read it and to think about it and to meditate upon the scripture. Um, letting God speak to me through the Bible. Number two uh, is prayer. And, uh, and, and how I do my prayer life, I'm, and actually I'm going to have a little bit of problem with my screen here because I know I've got three or four slides and I don't remember where the slides change here. But in my prayer life, uh, number one, I do have a specific list of things that I pray for every day. I do have a specific list of things that I pray for. I, have, I pray for my children every day. I think Job prayed for his kids every day. I think it's appropriate for a dad to do that. I pray for my children every single day. And they are on a list and I have certain things that I pray for them every day. And I have a list of things that I pray for. I write them down, those prayers. And the other thing that I do is um, I, I not only write out my prayers, but I also have, I have a written prayer list, but I also have in my written prayer list a place where I can write answers. I stopped doing that for a while. And I've got to tell you something, one of the most encouraging things that can ever happen in a Christian's life is to be able to look back and see where God answered prayers. 
And so I started it back up. And I do that now, and I have, I change my prayer list, I keep a prayer list for a month, and then at the end of the month I change and put a new one out. But um, I like the fact that, it, that I can look every single month and see that God answered prayers. Every month I can see pray, prayers that are answered. I can see other things that I've been praying for for a very long time. But I can see answers to prayer every month. And uh, places where I write those down, allow those things, you, and, and in your prayer life, don't just pray for that, uh, you know, a list of, you know, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. Even though I have a prayer list of things that I'm praying for every day, I allow what God taught me that day to influence how I pray for that over those things on the list. Um... I, 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 I was thinking I would bring up some personal illustration. I'm not going to do that. But I, I pray for my son who's a pastor in Anacortes every single day. Every day. But I pray different things for him every day. Oftentimes based upon what I read in the scriptures that day. I learned something that not only helps me in my life. But boy, it's something. Boy, Lord, would you teach this to Bohannon? <clears throat> some of it, Bo, probably wouldn't appreciate me praying for. You know, God, would you teach Bo humility? You know, you know, you know, and I know the only way Bo can be humil have humility is to be humility humiliated. So God brings some act of humiliation in Bohanna's life today. I'm just bringing up a, you know, kind of a, but that, but if, if what I read that day has to do with humility or humiliation, that might be something I pray for Caleb. I pray for Caleb to be humiliated. And I, uh, you know, and, and there are times when I'm reading the scriptures and the scriptures talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes. And it's talking about growing the ministry. And I pray that their ministries, Caleb's ministry and Bohanna's ministries grow and expand. But there are other days when the Bible speaks about the fact that in order for us to really grow in the Lord we have to be humbled and so Lord I'm, I'll pray Lord I don't want them to have huge congregations unless they have a walk with you and so don't give them huge congregations and no walk with you I don't want this to ever be or and I don't want this in my life either I don't want to ever get so busy in the ministry that there's no time to walk with God and like I say, I know a lot of pastors like that. I don't want to ever have that kind of ministry. And, and learn to pray around and let the things that God has spoke to you in your prayer life influence how you pray for others. Write out, uh, you know, let me see what else have I got here. Allow those things you heard from God uh, in your Bible reading to lead and influence your prayers. And then um, uh, I write out, you don't have to do this, but I, I have a prayer list. But I also have a section where I can write out a prayer every day. And I learned that from George Washington. Even during the uh, Revolutionary War, Washington twice a day took the time to pick, take out paper and pencil and write his prayers to God. And I, I don't do that with every single prayer, but every day I take the time to write out a prayer, to write what's on my heart to God and write out a time, uh, write out a prayer and keep track of those. And I've been doing that almost since I started the ministry. I've started out doing it in three ring, uh, not three ring binders, but spiral uh, notebooks and uh, those kind of things. I still have those spiral notebooks from prayers that I started in the 80s. And, uh, uh, and still have those and, 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 and just keep in there. But write out some prayer, write out your prayer, some of your prayer life. Then the ministry, that's that generosity thing, reaching out to others, ministry. I want to purposely minister to people every day. And so I, I use my devotional journal to help me to do that. And what I do is, is this, to, um, reaching out to people. And how I look at it is um, sometimes I'll reach out to someone through a letter or a card. Uh, sometimes through an email or a text. Sometimes through a phone call, sometimes through a personal visit, sometimes it'll be out door knocking, sometimes it'll be just going out and helping someone, you know, they need to move or they need some firewood or whatever it's going to be, and I just go in and help someone. And what I do is I write down that I've done that. Here's the reason I write them down. Not because I want everyone, someday, you know, I'm going to be dead, my boys are going to be looking through my journal and say, look what dad did on this day. I don't want to do that. I want to write it down because I want to see when I don't reach out. <laughs> So that I can hold myself accountable that I do something to be generous to others every day. I want to be generous. I, and I think, I think giving someone a, a gospel tract is a generous thing to do. I didn't have to give them a gospel tract. I could have just stayed to myself. I could have just, you know, enjoyed my wife and my kids and my house and my whatever and, uh, and just stayed to myself and let people around me do whatever they're going to do and, uh, and, and head to hell if they want to. I could have done that, but it's a generous thing to take some time 
and attention and put it on another person and say, I want to give you this to you and, and I hope you'll take the time to read it and give them a gospel tract, whatever. It's a generous thing to go no knocking doors and invite someone to come to church. It's a generous thing to do. It's, it's, it's reaching out to them and trying to help them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to do things that are ministries and outreaches and generous to others. Um, I also record um, when others minister to me. I always like to keep track of the fact, I want to be aware of the fact that, that not only am I, do I want to be ministered to, but I'm also being ministered to. People reach out and are generous to me on a regular basis in a lot of different ways, and I want to keep track of that. And, and, and I keep a track of it in, in, in these, these four columns is how I do it now. Number one, uh, sermons heard. I try to listen to someone, a message, uh, you know, and I don't listen to a message every single day, but, uh, uh, but I, I, I try to do that from time to time is to listen to a sermon. Or I read uh, books, and I record what I'm learning in the books. Uh, and, uh, and I look at that, someone writes a book, and I get the book, and I read from that book. I think that's that person out re making ministering to me and, and they've learned something and they've taken the time to put it down on paper and, and to publish it and I have a va access to it and I'm learning from them through that that's a ministry to me I read books um, wisdom from friends people in the church or others who speak to me uh, in fact the reason I'm giving this message is because um, uh, at one point not no I don't remember how long ago I actually put my philosophy down on paper and sent it to two or three friends of mine preacher friends and said would you just kind of look at this and tweak it and see what you think and Help me out. I want to kind of d develop it some. And one of the preachers said, hey, I'm going to teach this at my church this week. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, if the, he's going to, I probably ought to too. And so since I put it together, it seemed like it'd be a good idea for me to, you know, tell my church what I'd be. Anyway, so, um, and, and just wisdom from friends. And then also uh, blessings received. People do kind things for me, and I want to acknowledge that. And I write it down when people acknowledge it. And, the, and then the final thing tonight is um, a journal. And all of this is really a journal. Everything I've talked about is really part of my journal. But I also have a section where I just write a brief summary of... of uh, all that has been a part of my walk with God that day. Um, um, sometimes it's a redundant thing, and I, I wrote it down where someone gave me a blessing or was blessed me in some way, and then I write it down in a more general way in my journal part and uh, write it down there. Sometimes there's a repetition that happens there, but uh, I try to be more specific in the section about ministries and so forth. I'm more specific in my journal action, uh, section. I'm a little less specific. I'm more general about that. Just kind of how God worked and how God moved in my life during that day. Just kind of keep it in a general term. The conclusion of this whole thing is this. Um, again, I don't believe that my walk with the Lord is perfect. But I can say, say this, my walk with God has sustained me th through some really difficult things. And I have had some times in 30 years of ministry, I have had some times where I wondered how in the world I was going to stand behind the pulpit next week. There have been some times where I wondered if it was going to be possible for me to come back to church again and get up in front of a congregation and say this book is true and it's right and because my life was going through such turmoils that I was wondering if it was going to be possible for me to continue on with the Lord Jesus Christ and I can tell you that that walking with God has sustained me and gotten me gotten me through and uh, and, and 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 gotten me through some very very challenging times and uh, again I'm, you don't have to do your devotion you don't have to do exactly like me but what I would encourage is that you do something purposeful with your walk with God that you do it every day not just sometimes but that you put together a plan that you can do every day and that you do it as unto the Lord not machine not like a machine where well you know I got to do my devotions today in fact I don't even like that term devotions anymore I don't think there's anything wrong with it uh, originally but what happens is is it becomes a duty I got to do my devotions so I really do, uh, I express mine, I've got to go spend some time with God. I've got to go visit with the Lord. I've got to, I, I, I've got to walk with God. I say it in those terms because um, I don't ever, I think it's going to be harder for me, and so far it's worked, I think it's harder for me to turn it into a ritual when I say, Let me, Anita, uh, excuse me for about two hours, I'm going to go walk with God. Um, that's going to be much more difficult for me personally to, in my mind to let it become some kind of religious duty than it would be if I say, well, I'm going to go do this devotion. 
And I want to go, I want to make sure that my life, my relationship with God is real and alive and that it's not just some thing that I do, but that I am walking with the Lord and that, uh, that I'm doing that on a purposeful way.